Okay, we'll wait for people to hop back into this from the other stream. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulty. We lost internet there for a minute, so I think we're back up and running now. Um, so to get back to what uh, we were talking about as far as these tailwaters are concerned, we've moved through the um, hard baits, and um, we'll get go ahead and progress on to uh, some of the other hard baits that you might look to use, which uh, are going to be your uh, diving crankbaits, so your lift or build baits. Um, and those are going to run in an assortment of sizes, diving ability, um, and uh, colors. And again, just like with our spoons and slabs, jerk baits, we're really looking to mimic uh, shad or other uh, natural bait sources that are in um, these tailwaters. So your common colors are going to be silvers as a base color or chartreuse as a base color. And then, um, and then kind of tailoring it from there. Uh, so obviously your bass baits are going to be uh, more of a short stocky. Uh, typically they're not very deep divers. Uh, your square bills are going to be kind of that one to four foot range and then four to eight, eight to 12. Uh, after that, you're really getting into more like walleye uh, diving crankbaits and those can be effective as well. But good base colors in your tailwaters are going to be that dark back um, in the stained water, the chartreuse, if you're in real clear water, something that's going to be more lifelike of uh, the shad, which is going to be that silver with some type of darker back. So that silver, um, real dark green, dark black, uh, dark blue. Um, square bills probably aren't going to be your best bet unless you have fish high up in the water column. So if you see surfacing fish uh, and you don't have top water, um, or maybe there's just a lot of uh, dorsal fins that are breaking, kind of that swirl that they'll create uh, a shallow diving crankbait, like a square bill, keeping it up near the surface can find, certainly find some fish. Uh, when you're looking to get out into that deeper water, farther down into the water column, you start looking for your bigger build baits, your four to eight foot divers at a minimum, but you're probably looking at the eight to 12 footers. That current is going to give you a lot of help. Um, so when you're casting, uh, anything into these tailwaters with the artificial, you're always starting your cast a little bit upstream um, just to give yourself the biggest stretch of time to really get into that strike zone. And the key with any fishing, especially with artificial lures, is um, maintaining your distance in that strike zone for as long as possible. The longer you can stay where fish are actively feeding in the water column, more likely that you're going to get bit um, over time with making those casts. So slender, deeper diving crankbaits like that are often labeled as walleye baits. Um, this has that big bill and your depth of your dive is going to be based off of not only the size of the bill, but also at the angle off of the bait. So the, the more dramatic the angle is with the bait and the longer the bill, the more water that it displaces, which is, allows it to dive deeper and deeper and deeper. And with moving current, once you get parallel um, from yourself and you're moving down and you're fishing that bait perpendicular through that current, as it gets even with you and then a little bit downstream, this bait is then getting a lot more current pressure, which is ultimately going to give it more action. It's going to get more erratic. It's going to dive a little bit deeper and then you're going to work it back to you. The only knock on hard crankbaits, um, because they are going to give you the most flash. They're going to give you the most, um, different types of reactionary action, which is going to be flash sound rattle. Um, all these baits, these hard baits in particular are going to have rattle balls in them. Some of them will have light. Some of them, um, are going to have different builds on them to give them more of a, a different type of wobble. And all of that is generating that reactionary strike. And so um, that's why crankbaits are so effective in open water, but they're particularly effective in tailwaters where you're dealing with all this natural bait source and you're just trying to get a fish's attention. You get these nice bright flashy colors that are easy to see in this more turbid moving current of a water. Um, and you're also getting the sound with it. And so fish can key in on it. The problem is, is that all these crankbaits typically have two or three treble hooks on them. and the diving ones in particular in that faster moving current, when you're casting out those first 15, 20 yards that maybe you're working through, you're in open water. You're not 
you know, you might get within a few feet of the bottom, but you have no threat of hanging up on laydowns or boulders or any type of fishing line or other snags that may be in the water. Um, and so when you, when you're fishing back to, you, you're always fishing uphill when you're on the bank, even when you're in a river, it's going to get shallower, the closer it gets to you and diving baits are going this way. You're up here. So the closer that they get to the shoreline, they're going to start finding the bottom if you don't let up on them. And the problem with tailwaters is oftentimes that current line pushes almost all the way up to the bank, if not all the way to the bank. So what happens is you might slow down your retrieve, but that bait is now past you. So that current is just diving that bait without you doing anything. Whereas when you're on still water up on the lake and you're using a diving crankbait and they float, the second that you stop reeling, that bait is going to work its way back to the surface. Whereas when you're in current, that current is now essentially you retrieving. Um, so letting off doesn't do you a whole lot of good. So hard baits, expensive, don't like to lose them. Um, they can be a dangerous proposition if you're not steadily getting into fish. Crankbaits are great when you have an active bite because you don't really have to worry about the threat of getting those snags if you're not out there just filtering water and you're not catching fish. Um, when you're getting bit out there and where you think that you're, you know, you're finding that big portion of those actively feeding fish, then running your crankbait into the ground as you get near the uh, bank and snagging up is less of an issue. Uh, but because of technology, different brands, just the explosion of the fishing industry over the last 20 years, um, we have all of these great different brands and makes and models of all these baits. So it really gives us as the angler, a lot of options. And typically your crankbaits are going to be your widest selection of colors, sizes, um, bait profiles, and then all the other reactionary elements that they build into these baits. So lots and lots of different types of, of diving type crankbaits. And in those cases, again, looking for basic colors, uh, shad are always going to be that primary food source in these tailwaters. And in some cases, skipjack heron, but skipjack are going to get much bigger, much quicker. Um, they're often too big of a bait source for your small to medium sized fish that are in the tailwaters. Um, and that's where the those slender baits, your jerk baits, your walleye type crankbaits, they are a really good size profile when they're bigger because they're nice and slender and uh, temperate bass in particular, large striped bass. So a 20, 30 pound striped bass still only has a mouth on it that's equivalent to like a two or three pound large mouth. So that's where these crankbaits really, you know, you see these big body profiles and you're catching two pound largemouth up on the lake with them because they can open that mouth way up. Whereas your striped bass, even the bigger ones, their total mouth is, you know, much more in line with kind of the width and length of their body. Uh, whereas largemouth bass, sunfish, crappie, they have a much bigger mouth opening based you know, in relationship to their uh, body size. So long slender baits are always going to do better uh, when you're fishing with for striped bass, temperate bass, even walleye, sawgye, things like that. So um, always something to think about when you're out there, especially, you know, depending on what the key species are. When you're fishing smaller tailwaters, um, smaller impoundments where you're you're less likely to have the temperate bass in there. You might be dealing with large mouth, small mouth, spotted bass, crappie, um, and then just some other, you know, smaller size fish, then those uh, bass style crankbaits, the uh, medium to shallow divers are going to be a little bit more effective than those longer slender ones. And you also probably have a better opportunity to fish those jerk baits more effectively in that kind of more condensed, smaller, less flow water that comes out of either spillway dams or out of dams that maybe only have a couple of gates that they're going to open up. But in those big, massive tailwaters that um, are so renowned for fishing here in the state. You're really looking for the bigger bait profiles, deeper divers, but those treble hooks, they come into play. We hate to see lose people lose seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve dollar lures if they don't have to. So it's something to think about. One of the things that I give as a tip in our walleye and saw guy courses is that when you're using those deeper diving baits, especially for a fish like a saw guy or a walleye or a sauger that spends all of its time down in the bottom third of the water column removing those treble hooks. Um, so the ones that either have dual treble hooks or triple treble hooks, move, removing the front ones for sure. The front and the middle one, if it has three treble hooks, then you can maybe leave the treble hook on the back, or you can replace that treble hook on the back with a 
medium, small to medium size, straight shank hook and put that on. And then you can dive that bill down into the bottom and hit all different types of debris structure snags. And you're less likely to get held up. Um, that single point hook, because it's back behind the bait and that bait is driving through the structure, hitting it, knocking it. You get what feels like the sensation of a bite sometimes. Oftentimes it, it gives you pause. So it allows that bait to just move up enough to keep going without getting snagged up. So something to think about with those build baits is removing treble hooks, diving them down. And that way you don't have to worry about it. If you get down current and you're bringing it back to the bait, you're just banging that bait all the way home. And in those cases, in areas that have like walleye and saw guy, you're apt to pick up one of those fish in that last 15 feet of the retreat. So crankbaits when tailored, um, to the specific fishing location and species you're going after can be wildly effective with just some simple modifications from how they come out of the box. Um, yeah, can also use the lure as a handle if you remove the, the front treble hooks. And that's a good point too. You go and you get toothy critters that those walleye and saw guy get on the back of it and you're not lipping them, you know, being able to hold on to the front of these long slender baits, give yourself um, an opportunity to get those pliers in there and get the hook out. So that's a good point. Um, my favorite of the hard baits as a bank angler are the lipless crankbaits. Um, they're versatile uh, and they really give you, the angler, the best chance to control uh, the depth, speed, and the success of whether or not you're constantly getting snagged up. So based on the weight of the lure, when you're fishing in tailwaters, you're going to be using those bigger sizes of the lipless crankbait. So you're going to be starting off in low flow at maybe a quarter ounce, but more typically you're starting off at that half ounce size, maybe all the way up to an ounce. That's where maybe blades will come in a little bit handier than a bigger rattle trap or a bigger lipless crankbait. You can use a bladed bait, which is essentially a lipless crankbait, just without the hollow body and the rattles and the balls that are inside to give that extra action. It's just the shaved piece of metal. And like the spoons and slabs, because it is just a shaved piece of metal, it has a much uh, you know, denser, heavier weight in a smaller package. So blades like the spoons and slabs is a good cast and retrieve lure like the lipless crankbait where you're in control of where you're at in the water column based on the size of the lure, the depth and current speed that you're fishing at, as well as your retrieve speed. So you're in control of all three when you're casting, you know exactly what you're getting yourself into and you can avoid snag ups a lot easier when you're using these lipless crankbaits and it just like the um your diving baits you're going to get a huge selection of colors um and a lot of them depending on the brand um bill lewis is who makes the original rattle trap most people say rattle trap rat rattle trap is a is a brand name it's a rat slash l slash trap it's not r-a-t-t-l-e trap um, and it's just a lipless crankbait. The two major suppliers of lipless crankbaits from um, from big name brands are going to be Bill Lewis and then Strike King. Uh, and then Bass Pro, just like all their other types of lures that are out there, are going to have their generic version of a lipless crankbait. And then you're going to find some smaller brands that make their specialty lipless crankbaits. And those are typically going to run on the more expensive end. Um, Bill Lewis rattle traps are not cheap to begin with. They're going to run somewhere in the seven to ten dollar range, just depending on where you're purchasing them at. Uh, but they do give you a lot of great shad colors. Most of these colors are mimic or um, similar to uh, your diving crankbait. So you're going to get the same color patterns, just in a little bit different uh, body shape and profile. The Bill Lewis rattle traps are a um, kind of a tighter wobble when you're reeling them fast, they have more of a consistent body width the entire way through them. They have that little flat piece with your connector just above. So this flat piece on the head right here is essentially your bill. That's what's diving it into the water and moving water around. And it just creates a real nice tight wobble and, you know, color schemes, keeping that Keeping the little shad patch on there can sometimes be helpful, but these are going to come in so many different color ranges with blue backs and orange, straight silver, um, and then everything in between. And keeping, uh, you know, the principles of 
current and water turbidity, just like when you're fishing on the lake, the more stay in the water, the higher flow, your brighter, more vibrant colors or darker colors that are going to contrast really well in that stained water. When the water flow may not be as heavy or it's a lot clearer, you're going to look to utilize more natural color presentations. So silvers, um, and then matching whatever bait source may be in there. So sunfish, you might look to use something that's more of a green pumpkin base in those situations. But for the most part, stick into a silver or chartreuse as the base color. And then, you know, having a few different options of maybe a blue and orange as the accent colors or chartreuse and orange. Um, red is always a good alternative color here in Oklahoma. Um, so a Bill Lewis rattle trap versus a Strike King lipless crankbait. Here is the Bill Lewis rattle trap with their classic craw, um, that red pattern. And then here's a Strike King. And you have a little bit different body shape, much broader head on it in, as compared to the rest of the body. So this is going to have a wider wobble. You're going to get a lot more kind of tail whip on this. Whereas the rattle traps are going to be more of a tight wobble, kind of keeps it in line as it's going through. They both have very good action. Both of them have the rattles in them. So they make a lot of noise, displace good amount of water and are good reactionary um, lures. But red is always a good alt color if you're not using that shad pattern. Uh, does really well in our turbid water. And with the rattle traps or the lipless crankbaits, it is a straight cast and retrieve lure. You can jig them and allow them to flutter down like a spoon, but it's typically not necessary. You're casting those out a little bit up current and immediately beginning your retrieve because unlike the build baits that require pressure and reel speed to dive them, your lipless crankbait is weighted just like a blade and it's going to be sinking the entire time unless you're reeling fast enough to keep it from falling anymore. Um, so these are the quarter ounce size profile and then... The half ounce size profile is not too much bigger as far as um, <clears throat> the actual uh, length profile of the bait, but they are, you can feel the considerable difference um, in weight between the quarter ounce and the half ounce. So here's a quarter ounce, here's a half ounce. Bait profile size, not much of a difference. These are also just a really good overall size profile. When I talked about earlier about how in the tailwaters is the one um, part of fishing here in Oklahoma where I'm a, an advocate of sizing up your tackle. Um, whereas most of the time I'm a big advocate of downsizing this, you know, most of the time, even big fish are munching on one inch, two inch minnow, shad, crayfish. They're eating a smaller bait source. And unless they're willing to give that reactionary bite, a lot of times they're just going to let those lures pass, especially in colder water um, where they're burning a lot of calories. They got to make it worth it. In tailwaters, fighting all that current, constantly having to feed, they're looking to get significant calories every time they're feeding. Hence, bigger baits, they're going to look to target those. Um, but Lipless crankbait, super, super, super easy to fish. Cast them up just a little bit upstream, start your retrieve. And then from there, all you're looking to do is tailor your retrieve speed and how far upstream you're casting, again, to get that bait down into the part of the water column that holds the most actively feeding fish. And in some cases, especially as we get into April and into May, sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes there are so many fish that will stack up in those tailwaters when water's being released that they're just dispersed throughout the water column. Um, and that's where a good search bait that makes a lot of noise, like a, a lipless crankbait, is really going to be your best friend. Um, so the next of our hard baits, uh, don't see any more questions. So the next of our hard baits are going to be our top water. Um, and this is going to come into play as we get a little bit later into the spring, as we get into late April, May into June, especially those temperate bass species, the white bass and hybrids and stripers, they're going to push up into the water column. Water will get warmer, bait fish will get more active. Those bait fish are going to seek the shallow sheltered water, that back eddies, the seam lines. They're small fish, they're a schooling fish. They are not looking to be out in that main current if they can avoid it. So that's going to force those predator fish over into more accessible water for anglers. And you're going to, you're going to visually see them feeding. And in those cases, there's a lot of good options for top water. Um, 
technology again has come a long ways. We see baits today where we took kind of an original uh, design of a uh, have one, yeah, of the head and torpedo, which was a propeller bait to create some weight displacement and the gurgling that you get with bait fish when they're up on top. And you just have this simple little piece of shaved metal back here. And that's what you got. Well, now that's been upgraded in brands like uh, Berkeley with their Chapo or the Whopper Plopper, where you get a real big turning wheel that displaces a lot of water. And depending on how fast you're moving it, you get more sound, more water displacement. Um, and your top waters in your tail waters, because you're using current, you're looking for things that you can move quickly through the water. So you're not looking to use like... Um, like rattle frogs or um, even poppers sometimes can be difficult to move across the water because they're just moving so fast that it'll throw the bait over. It'll turn it over with that current, especially with that big hollow, um, the deeper bodied poppers like this, as they go back, as you're going to get a couple of really good pops when you cast this a little bit up river, those first few until it gets even with you. But then once it starts to get downstream of you and there's just so much current, it's going to struggle on those pops where it might get rolled over. Your line will get wrapped and twisted underneath those treble hooks. Um, so working baits more like walk the dog style lures or just straight retrieve lures like the Berkeley Chapo or like a buzz bait, something that will sit high up on the water and you're just looking to reel it in and you can get cover a lot of water before you get too far downstream. So walk the dog lures are going to be these um, kind of cigar shaped lures and these are meant to just be kicked back and forth across the water just like a bait fish or a lizard or a snake that's just kind of skating along the top and these are great in in medium moderate to low current because the current's doing half the work for you so essentially you only have to pop them once most of the time you fish these on slack water you're moving the rod tip and every time you move that rod tip as you time up your slack you're getting this bait to dart left right left right left right well when you're in current you already got one direction doing it for you. So when you pull it, it's going to turn into the current and then the current's going to turn it back. So essentially every time you pop it, you're only having to do half the work. And these are great. These walk the dog style lures, because when we're fishing for like temperate bass, especially white bass um, and small hybrids that really have a propensity to school up in great numbers and chase bait fish around and you'll get some surfacing activity, but there's a ton of activity that's going on in the few feet right below the surface. This is where we look um, to utilize what in the fly fishing community is known as like a dry dropper or a hopper dropper. And you're just going to take a leader line 10 pound test is probably as heavy as you need to get because you're more than likely going to hook into fish that are under 10 pounds and it can get a little wonky trying to tie a hook on. But what we're doing is we're attaching a leader line to our rear treble hook. And there's a few ways you can do that. It's really up to the angler how they, you know, what they prefer. You can tie it. You can just tie a straight knot off of the uh, portion of the bait that holds onto the treble hook. You could tie it through the eye hole of the treble hook. You could tie it by wrapping it around those three points and tying a cinched up knot to the base, or you can create just a loop. So you take a leader line, double it over, and then just tie a simple overhand square knot and pull that through. Try to keep that loop when you're finished as small as possible. So work, work your knot kind of up until you just get to the, the smallest possible size, something that your finger really can't fit through. Um, and you can use like some pliers or uh, some clippers to make sure that it's nice and cinch tight. Then from there, you're going to cut your tag, leave a little bit of the tag. The fish aren't going to see this. And just to make sure that if you do hook into a fish uh, on the dropper, that first fish you catch is really going to cinch that knot up for you. So leaving just a little bit of tag to make sure you don't get line slippage because that's no fun. You hook into a good fish, you're reeling it in and that knot pops on you. And then from there, all you do is take the main line down below, double it over. So you have a little end, makes it easier to force it through the loop that you uh, created. And we're just going to create a little lasso here. So we pull that through, 
we get our main line going, create a nice big open loop like this, our little lasso, and then you can just wrap that around the entire treble hook on the back and get it wedged on there and then just work it down to the base of the hook shank. So where all those points turn, get it in there and then you're cinched up nice and right below. And then you only need about a foot. So for tag end purposes, take about 18 inches to two feet. So you have plenty of line to tie on and then clip that off the back. And then this is going to be very good with like a hair jig. So like a little cheap marabout, marabou jig, the uh, Johnson, beetle boughs you can get like a 10 pack for like under two bucks and they're great for white bass by themselves when the white bass are running um so you just take on something in a white or a chartreuse 132nd ounce 1 16th ounce don't use anything bigger than a 1 16th ounce a 1 8th ounce might drag the back of the bait so we're looking for something that's pretty weightless underneath so we can still work the top water action but then we get our dry off the back and then you're just going to take if you're using 10 pound test um with these small jig heads, you're kind of forced into a situation to tie either like a trialene or a uh, improved clinch knot. But because it's 10 pound test, you only need about five twists on there. Um, three to five twists is going to be plenty, especially because you're more than likely going to be catching fish that are under five pounds. Um, now, if you tag into a big hybrid or striper, that's just going to be a fun rodeo to get them in, depending on what your rod and reel class are at and the your main line, but 10 pound leader is going to hold on to a lot of fish, especially if your drag set well, and then pinch off that tag again, leaving just a hair because of that big thick line. When you're using a improved clinch with anything over eight pounds, leaving just a little bit of tag. So when you do hook into that fish, it's really going to tighten that knot up for you. And you get something that looks like this. So this is up on the top of the water and this is going to drop down below it and it's just going to follow. And because this is a slow moving walking bait, this is just going to get subtle kind of like bobber jigging action. And a lot of times you'll get white bass, you know, you can get a triple hookup with this. You get a couple white bass come up and grab this. That's getting the attention of everything else. White bass comes and gets the bottom and you end up doubled up a lot or even tripled up because of the dual trebles. So real good option in the slack water times, uh, especially as we get into later April, but typically it's in May, um, into June, you'll see those surfacing white bass come up and that's a great option. It's a visually stimulating type of fishing. You get those topwater, uh, blow ups that everybody loves topwater fishing for, because unlike, uh, fly fishing out West in real crystal clear water, where you might be like sight fishing for individual fish, or maybe you're in one of our clear water Eastern Oklahoma streams where you're targeting like some river suckers and you're casting to those fish. Most fishing in Oklahoma is unseen. So you're fishing subsurface. You can't see your bait. You don't see the strike. So top water action, we get that real cool visual blow up. And then adding that little extra piece on can go a long ways for white bass. Um, especially if they don't favor what your topwater lure is more than likely they're grabbing that, um, marabou jig and you can use little small hair jigs, um, a baby shad, a, like a little Bobby Garland on a one thirty second ounce jig head is going to work real well. The one thing you want to avoid is don't use things that have like bumper tails or curly tails on them because you're moving too slow and those soft plastics are meant to have some action to them so that that tail can spin out or that bumper can flick. You're looking for straight tail, like Bobby Garland, baby shad. And that tail is going to be moving for you anyways in the current or even in the still water. If you're not using some type of, um, a hair jig, which, oh, here they are. Um, so something like this, like a VMC dominator or any of their other type of jig heads, hair jigs that they make. This is going to have that one eighth ounce head on it, and it's just going to drag the, the back of that bait. But hair jigs are a good cast and retrieve lure. They're kind of in between. So we have our hard baits and then we have our soft plastics. Your hair jigs are falling in between um, your marabou, your bucktails, um, and they're going to look something like that. And that's just a really basic temperate bass. And they make these all the way sized up like the spoons and slabs. So you can get a half ounce um, whole ounce, ounce and a half hair jigs. And those are good ones uh, when the fish are a little finicky, especially during peak fishing windows. And these fish are seeing a lot of hard baits coming through, lots of crankbaits, um, 
lots of swim baits that are moving through the water. Not a lot of people use hair jigs um, consistently and it, they give off just that perfect, very lifelike, subtle pulse. And you can oftentimes get into those fish when they're actively feeding and they're not willing to give chase to the big soft plastics or the hard crankbaits because they've seen too many of them. They're, you know, they're pressured. Slowing it down with the hair jig can sometimes be the key to getting bites on those slower days. Um, and they work great as a dropper for um, your walk the dog style baits. Other like little crappie magnets. So real small 132nd ounce jig like these that you'll find for crappie. Those will also serve um, as a good dropper for those walk the dog style lures. You can also try them with poppers um, by dropping off the bottom. But again, poppers can be somewhat difficult to fish when you have that rushing current. Walk the dog lures just work a little bit better. Uh, now with other top water baits like... Um, your your buzz baits Let's see. your buzz baits are are kind of a, a hybrid top water because that blade is up on the top of the water and then your skirt and your trailer are subsurface so you're kind of getting the best of both worlds and you can you know rig those in a few different ways but some other walk the dog style lures and those bigger bait profiles that you can work big golden shiner with that shad spot on it and these are, you know, big profile lures. And these are four, five, six, seven inch bait profiles. And just like the jerk baits, these come size up that nice long slender body, but things like this. And you could again run some type of dropper off of these. These are going to be much bigger than your Heaton spooks um, and even junior spooks. So here's that spook. And then here's a, you know, bigger kind of saltwater type top water lure but these are good for our temperate bass species when you get out in those big tail waters for tail water beginner would the best bait for a hard bait be a rattle trap i would think so i mean that's usually my recommendation in most of these um ask an angler courses for bank anglers especially anytime you're going to a new body of water um in a tail water, you can size up a little bit. So starting with like a quarter ounce or maybe a half ounce, but sticking to like a basic, if you're using like a Bill Lewis rattle trap, just their basic chrome silver black back, um, you're just a straight shad imitator. Uh, in still water, when you're fishing like a dam, points, public access coves, then I size down to the eighth ounce version of that bait. And it's just a great overall fan cast search bait catches lots of different species and when there is a particular species that's really keyed into the area that you're in white bass crappie hybrid striped bass largemouth bass um, sometimes even like saw guy those rattle traps can you know they're just a really easy bait to fish and they can be super productive but they're always one of the best if not the best multi-species catching bait so you can throw them in an area like a tailwater that's going to be this big mixed bag of all these different species kind of pooled up into these basins right below the dams. So yeah, for a beginner, definitely uh, rattle trap, lipless crankbait, something in a very basic silver black back. It's going to be the easiest way to get you on fish the quickest and you can refine your approach uh, from there. So let's look at some of the buzz bait top water. So buzz baits are pretty simple. They just have a uh, have one or two two blades on the top. That's what holds them up. That spinning as you're coming back to you, it keeps them up on the top of the surface, and then it allows the rest of the bait to drift down into the film. So here is. some dual buzz baits, dual blades. So these are gonna push a lot of water. These dual blade ones are great when you're in the tail waters because you're gonna move a lot of water, looks like a school, a bait fish up on the top. Colors, very basic. A dark color or a light color with that chartreuse flash in it. And then with these, some of them are gonna come with the trailer hook. You could tip that with a live minnow or a Chad, you can tip these with a soft plastic trailer, um, especially like your single blades. 
something like this. So this one is actually on uh, where it's allowed to pivot. So this one is uh, give you a lot of good action. A lot of times this is more of a fixed, uh, depending on the brand. It's going to be fixed, so it's going to stay right like this. This one allows it to get a lot more wobble action. So using instead of a bumper tail, maybe like a flute tail on the end, that split tail. But you can certainly pair these up with a big four, five, six, seven inch soft plastic in a chartreuse or a uh, or a white. Typically, you want to try to match your uh, soft plastic trailer with kind of the skirt color. So if you're using a big black uh lure like this or a um like dark blue or a green pumpkin keeping your soft plastic fairly similar in color to that um, is going to get you a bit more often but your tried and true have to have are going to be you know one solid dark color like a black is always going to be good and then a light colored one either a straight chartreuse straight white white and chartreuse and then mixing and matching your favorite soft plastics which in this case are going to be either bumper tail uh big soft plastic swim baits or flukes those are going to be the two primary um, trailers that you're going to look to utilize with those baits and just like with all these other uh lures that we're talking about and using on these tail waters with that current you're still starting off casting all of these little bit up current give yourself a few seconds on those first few retrieves to really get the bait working and then as it comes in to where it's getting even with you in that current and working it back to you you give yourself this 15 20 foot window where that's where the strikes most likely are going to come and then you can work your way down the shoreline at these areas and just continue to target different areas um, another so our two kind of hybrid hard soft baits, um, just like our top water with the buzz baits, are going to be your bladed jigs and your spinner baits. And again, these are just going to be something that you're not going to be thrown as often in these areas. A lot of people are just going to elect for the either using live bait. Big swim baits are all the rage today, so you're going to see a lot of people throwing different styles of um, big soft plastic swim baits that are either pre-molded or that you're pairing with a jig head. Um, so you don't see a whole lot of the, um, the bladed jig or the spinner baits in the tail waters as you do when you're up on the lake or even in the main river system away from these tail waters. And with those, again, you're going to get the option to pair them with these big soft plastic trailers and utilizing, you know, these, flashier colors they come you get the nice blade you're going to displace a lot of water and the the key with these bladed jigs in water where these fish aren't seeing a lot of them is that you're getting essentially the same action out of what you're getting out of the hard baits um the difference being is that these are just giving off a little bit more of a subtle um signature when they're moving through the water so you get a good combination of the realism of today's swim baits uh, these soft plastics that are ribbed and they finesse the tails in a way that when they're swam through the water they're giving off signatures that are very very close to the real thing whereas your hard bait you know real fish don't sound and move like those you know hard baits you're mimicking and so when fish are either highly pressured or um, they're finicky for environmental reasons, whether it be weather, water temperature, air pressure, things like moon cycle, any of the little micro factors that can play big roles into the, the willingness of fish to give chase or to bite. This gives you a good kind of subtle hybrid because you're displacing water and making a little bit of noise with that blade on the front, but it's a lot less dramatic than what you're getting with the big rattles and the big flashes and, and huge turns and all of that water displacement that you get out of the hard bait. So bladed jigs are an often underutilized bait in the fishing world for artificials, but they can be deadly for a multitude of species. The one thing that they don't have going for them that can play a role in successful hookups is if you are in an area that has a lot of white bass or a lot of smaller hybrid striped bass, most of these bladed jigs come with a very big deep set hook. So on that turn, I mean, that's more than your finger as far as that gap goes. And we're talking about species that have 
kind of a smaller mouth in relation to their body. So with temperate bass, the great thing about these hard baits is they have multiple treble hooks on them. So when these fish come and they're taking strikes at baits that realistically they probably can't even fit in their mouth. Um, you know, they're looking to wound and stun. Maybe they get ripped apart. They can eat pieces as they come off. They're taking a face full of treble hooks. So while you may get one point actually in the mouth, what you end up with is that rear treble hook swinging around and smacking it in the face plate and getting two or three of those hook points embedded, which gives you better hookup success and ultimately allows you to land more fish. When you're using single point hooks, it's very important that the size of the fish that you're targeting matches up pretty good with what the size of that hook point is and where it is in relationship to the bait. And what I mean by that is if you're going to use a three inch trailer off of this, maybe a little curly tail grub or a little three inch swim bait. Well, the back of the bait is going to be about right here. If you're going to use a big five, six, seven inch bait profile to stick on this trailer, well, then you're back of your baits all the way back here. So not only are you having to overcome a fish with a smaller size mouth coming up over the back of the bait, it also has to get all of that bait in its mouth before it gets up over the hook point to set the hook. So what can be a frustration of anglers, and I hear it a lot about, you know, well, it was just small fish. We were just getting pecked by small fish. A lot of times it's big fish. Um, they just aren't having the ability to get up over that hook point. And it can be frustrating because you're getting bit all day long. You're getting that tug, but it's a short strike and they're grabbing the back of that soft plastic. And they're not able to get up over the hook point. Utilizing hard baits with trebles on the front and rear of the uh, bait almost inevitably ends up with hookups, even when they miss strike it and you get kind of a false hook set that is more of a snag on the side of the face. So bladed, but bladed jigs in the right situations, especially for like some bigger fish uh, or utilizing a smaller trailer so that when smaller white bass or hybrids or whatever else may be around two pound crappie um, blue cats, which are, Big predators. Um, blue cats at this time of year will take a lot of artificial lures, um, unlike your flatheads and your channel catfish that are less likely but isn't super rare to catch on an artificial. Blue cats are much more prevalent of catching them with shad mimicking baits at this time of year, especially in areas where they're highly concentrated, like below a dam on the tailwater where they rely heavily on the shad die offs at the end of the season. For the winter as we move back into the spring but the bladed jig is a is a river favorite of mine and it certainly can find you some lunkers occasionally but it is worth noting that you might get bit a lot and think that maybe you're getting small fish that are hitting it and it could be big fish they just they're not getting up over the back of that bait and then all your different types of spinner baits um Spinner baits are going to have kind of two classic blades, which are going to be the willow, which is the long leaf looking blade, and then your Colorado blade. And then you're going to have some hybrid blades, the Oklahoma blade and the Indiana blade, which are just kind of hybrids of the Colorado and of the willow. Um, but most typically, if you're buying just store bought box or big brand names or even generic brands that are mass produced are either going to have a combination of a willow and a Colorado. The Colorado is the small teardrop shaped one, willows, big leafy one, or you're going to have one that's got dual willows or dual Colorados on it. Um, and sometimes good bait suppliers will label what types of blades there are. Otherwise you have to know what they look like to know, you know, what is what. And again, these change and why there's an Oklahoma blade and Indiana blade on heavily pressured waters all bait manufacturers and professional anglers are looking to get a leg up by creating a signature in the water that hasn't been seen by those fish. Um, fishing in the artificial realm has really evolved over the last 30, 40 years where the curly tail worm and curly tail grub were like sliced bread and they just, you know, you couldn't outfish them. And that was because a lot of people before that were fishing for food. It wasn't until bass fishing in the 70s really started to kind of commercialize fishing. Prior to that, most fishing was done by, you know, the every person. You go out, you catch your dinner, didn't matter what it was, bass, catfish, you know, some of the river sucker type species and white bass. You go out, you catch your dinner, you come home. So live bait was pretty much the biggest game in town. Very few people were using artificial lures because they were looking to have success. They were trying to feed themselves, feed their family, or just, you know, put some extra food in the freezer. 
Um, and you're always going to have more year round success fishing with live bait. So as you got the tournament fishing involved, that's when the artificial lure industry just exploded. And it really kind of started with, you know, these soft plastic innovations, making these lifelike uh, signatures in the water. And that started with the curly tail grub and it evolved into curly tail worms and all the way to today where we're really seeing this huge technological development of, of swim baits, um, lifelike body presentations, lifelike movement, all of those things have evolved. And what happens is you get fish in heavily pressured water. They see all these types of baits. They start to get a little weary when they, you know, get those signatures. Uh, they get behind them, they get a little hook shy. And so you'll see as generations go on, these fish reproduce, they die. 20 years later, nobody's been using a grub for 20 years on this lake. All of a sudden you start throwing out the old soft plastic and like clockwork, it's, you know, the hottest ticket. So you kind of see this cyclical style of soft plastic evolution within the fishing industry. And it really comes, you know, it's really just driven by the tournament anglers and the different species and what they're looking to use. And then that funnels down into the commercialization of it. Once you get into the big box retailers. So bladed jigs, spinner baits, things that used to be, you know, they were the hottest ticket when they first came out. They've kind of run through their, you know, big run outside of professional bass fishing with with those two baits on lakes. So they just don't get a whole lot of uh, usage on the tailwaters. And it could be that little difference when fish are finicky or it's heavily pressured to get you bit. Um, and that kind of works us through now to our soft plastics. I don't see any more questions. Again, ask any questions. Um, we had that 10 minute uh, distraction where we lost our internet here. So uh, we'll, we'll run this as long as we need to, but ask questions as they come up. Uh, so for our soft plastics, like I said earlier in the presentation on the first bit of the stream, you know, curly tail grubs, three inch to five inch whites, chartreuses, silvers, uh, blacks, green pumpkins. Um, those are always going to be a hit, right? But when, again, when you're fishing in tail waters, you're fishing big disruptive water, especially when water is being released. That's why these hard baits, these chatter baits, these spinner baits, things that are creating a lot of action in the water, a lot of water displacement. You're trying to get fish's attention. Um, when you're fishing on the lake or you're fishing a small creek or river, oftentimes subtle, smaller approaches are going to get you bit from the bank a lot more often. In tailwaters where you have all this water disruption, all this natural prey source, all these different species in a very tight window, um, you, you're really looking to get their attention. And a lot of times throwing the small hair jig or the small grub, unless you have a really good back area or a really good seam line of kind of a slower run where you might get some of those smaller fish, your crappie, your black bass, your white bass to sit, and you can really pick them off in that smaller water, going to the tail waters, the big fun is getting into these substantially sized fish. And in order to get their attention, we got to use these big, bright, colored baits that are, you know, garnering a lot of attention in the water that are to them, they see a caloric rich meal as opposed to, am I going to go chase after that little, you know, hair jig or that small, subtle swim bait. So uh, when you're in the tail waters, when you're using soft plastics, big swim baits um, are going to be the key. And then pairing those with the advancements of people trying to create bait balls and all that, which has led us into the umbrella rigs, or what are commonly referred to as Alabama rigs. And your umbrella rig, your big box brand name models, your most popular one on the market today is going to be the Yumbrella. So it's made by Yum, and it's their umbrella rig, and it's going to have a couple of different versions that are readily available at any bait and tackle shop. And that's going to be their, uh, their five holder and their one holder. So the one holder has all these flasher blades, but it only is truly holding on to one hooked bait at the back. Whereas the five holder not only has the flashers, but it has the attachments to put on five hooked baits behind it. And what people have been pairing them with, you can take the cheapest route possible and you can get yourself a, a box of, you know, again, the, these are pretty weightless by themselves, so be mindful when you start putting jig heads on it. You want to keep the weight evenly dis distributed, so 
you don't want to have, you know, one of these have a much bigger weight on it than the other ones because it's going to try to move the bait. You want it in uniform. Um, and the cheapest route is going to get basic ball jig heads, you know, don't even have to be painted, just basic lead. Um, you can get a you know box of 10, 20 jig heads for pretty cheap. Um, with these in your tailwaters, probably only want to go up to about a quarter ounce jig head. Start with the 16th or an eighth ounce. And this is the opportunity to size down your lures because you're throwing a bait ball as opposed to one big lure. You can get away with that two, three inch bait profile, like a curly tail grub, um, like a sassy shad, something like that. That's a much smaller two inch, three inch profile and pair those with a one sixteenth ounce or a one eighth ounce um, jig head because each jig head you put on here, you know, you're going to add yourself up. So if you're using a quarter ounce on each one of these, you are essentially throwing a lure that is an ounce and a quarter when you go to throw it. Where with that eighth ounce, you're only throwing five eighths when you uh, are finished. So just depending on water flow and current where you need to get this to, you definitely want to keep these away from the bottom. Um, these are very expensive when it comes to, and it's not even the lure itself. It's just the holder for the lures. You know, these are going to run anywhere between 12 and 20 bucks just for one. So definitely keep them higher up in the water column. Start off with the lighter uh, levels of jig heads or pre-molded swim baits and just kind of tailor it from there. Um, but as far as good baits, your curly tail grubs are always going to be a winner and sassy shad. Those are going to be kind of your two uh, soft plastics that are not pre-rigged that you might be looking to use. And you can range anywhere from the, the two inch little crappie style um, soft plastic grubs or swim baits all the way up to, you know, maybe a five inch profile bait, just depending on, you know, what you're looking to get into as far as baits go. Um, let's see so for sassy shad sassy shad is also a brand name by mr twister but lots of uh mimickers are out there bass pro and some other brands are going to make a short a sassy shad is essentially a short stocky swim bait so in relation to its weight it is also a fairly deep bodied bait these are great put this on there you would attach your jig head right through the top, and then you're going to clip. These are all these snap swivels. So you snap, open your clip, and then you're going to slide the eye of your jig head onto these. There's also a more expensive route that you can take that is a little less um, is a little less cumbersome on rigging uh, are going to be your pre-molded swim baits, but these are going to be more expensive. You're going to get fewer of them but they're all uniform and they're very easy to put on. So wild eye storm brand shad are pretty good. So something like that. And these come in a bunch of different sizes. I like using the smallest size that they make. Uh, these are going to run in kind of that one sixteenth to one eighth ounce range. And it's already pre-molded internally weighted, very lifelike. And you can just go ahead and take a five pack of these right out of the box and fish them on these. And those are those are your two options. I mean, you use your jig head, um, a basic ball jig head with a curly tail grub. That's going to be the cheapest route, and sometimes that's all that's needed. That's going to be perfectly effective, and you're going to look to utilize either whites or a chartreuse style grub. So these are just going to be very basic, you know, like power bait model grubs that are super cheap. You can get them in bulk, and then just pair them with the plain unpainted lead jig head making sure that the hook point is always coming out on the tail side so when you put a jig head onto these tailed baits whether it be a paddle tail swim bait or a, a curly tail grub you're making sure that they're swimming properly while they're out there so here is a eight ounce jig head just a painted jig head white painted jig head. So when you go to rig your curly tail, most of these are pressed on the seam sides of the up and down of the tail, which makes it easy because you can go right down the seam line to the base. And ultimately with your jig, you're kind of looking to come out with these ribs 
you're looking to pull it out usually at about that second or third rib from the tail connection uh, for just a standard ball jig. And you're going to go in through the nose. So always through the top of the bait with that hook point. And you're just going to work the body of the bait up the hook shank. And we're going to pull that out in that second rib because we don't want it too bunched up, but we also don't want it to be too far back or it will sit way low. So that's pretty good right there. You're pretty even through there. Our tail side is up with our hook side that catches all the water. It twists out like this and you'll get five of those going through the water. This is a very cheap and effective way to rig your expensive umbrella rigs. So utilizing Storm Eye Shad or other Storm model pre, they're kind of the, the leader in the pre uh, molded swim bait. Lifelike, weights internalized, eye hole, that's all you need, right? Well, you get one of these and you get a pack of these and you get hung up, there goes 25 bucks to the bottom of the river. So if you're going to use the expensive uh, rig, you might elect to use the cheaper baits back behind them. And then same goes for like a box of uh, either uh, like speed swimmer shad. Those are real popular right now. Um, they're going to be kind of more of a grub style body. So even symmetrical doesn't have this big deep V on them. Um, typically they're called like pro swimmers or speed shad. Every brand has a different marketing touch on it, but they're essentially going to be evenly kind of your finger size shad with the little bumper tail on them. And those in a, oh, I actually have one right here. Something like this. So these are the power bait uh, brand swimmers. This is a dynamite color in Oklahoma. Different brands are going to have different names for the color. It's essentially a chartreuse body with a dark blue or grayish back. These are excellent in the waters of Oklahoma because aside from the very far eastern part of the state and our crystal clear um, Ozark and Washita stream systems, most of our water is prairie streams that have been dammed. So you're going to have some tint to the water inherently. And these are just such a dynamite um, bait profile as well as mimicking the shad base. And so many of our fish in Oklahoma, all of our predator species really key in on some chartreuse um, as opposed to like a straight silver. The silver is really more prevalent in the still water or in some clear water. When you have current and everything else moving, having something like this can go a long ways um, for all your predator species. This is a, just a dynamite color if there is one for Oklahoma that isn't just a standard chartreuse or a standard silver dark back shad. Um, if you're looking to mix a little color in, but these are great, put that on a 1 16th, 1 8 ounce jig head, throw that behind this. That's gonna give a lot of good bait profile, a lot of good flash. Um, and these are fairly cheap as well and you can buy them in bulk going to be a little bit more expensive than just your basic grub or even some of the soft plastic swim baits like a generic sassy shad like these are not mr twister these are bass pros brand i like these just because they give me a little bit smaller bait profile than the mr twister does in their smallest size so got a lot of these and they're cheaper and you get more of them and they essentially fish the same way so but with these the flat back of sassy shad is your backside and your indicator on any paddle tail, the top side. So even on the little pro swimmer or speed swimmer, that paddle tail, that is the downside of the bait. That's the belly where it's pointed. So your hook point should always be coming out on the top side of the boot. So take a jig head and run it in again, right through the nose of the bait. And with these, um, sometimes they can be a little difficult, especially these dual colored ones. The plastic may not have molded very well. There's some like hollow spots or soft spots inside the bait. And because it's not really a true flat back, um, it doesn't work its way up the shank very well. You'll, the more you do them with these, the better you'll get. But one of the common problems that you'll get right off the bat, and I undered this one just a little bit, but you can see how it sits off that hook point. You really want the back of that bait coming off and being as parallel with that hook point as possible. 
only for the reason that it's not that it's not going to swim right through the water, but you're essentially have your hook point turned back down towards the eye hole where the bait's at. So again, getting that fish to come up and over. Um, but these, are, these don't always play nice. It's not a grub or um, a more slender swim bait like this. It's going to be a lot easier to do it the first time. These try to fight against you. The good thing is, is most of the time, especially the ones that are not um, collared at the seam. So like that's a little too far, right? So we're bun bunched up just a little bit. So the easiest way that people find with these until they just, you get really familiar with the brand that you're using is, so that's, that's what you're looking for when you're finished is looking like that. Um, but again, you can see having to re-rig it twice, how much damage it did to the other side of the jig head. So now it's not staying on that collar very well. And that just has a tendency with any of these dual colored baits where the seam line is through the middle of the bait and you're basically rigging down that seam line. You're just working the plastic away from um, itself. Whereas something like this, that doesn't have that big seam line, it's going to be a lot hardier. But if you want, when you're starting out, especially with soft plastics that you're not super familiar with and haven't been using a lot of, the easiest way to know where to pull that hook point out is just take the bait before you put it on and pull the nose of that bait up to the above the collar. So here's our collar. It's going to sit flush up against the base of the ball of the jig head. And you just hold your bait top side up pinch it there, hold it back, don't stretch it, just, and then you know that this is the spot. So you can hold that, you can hold that with, kind of eyeball it, maybe even pick a rib that you can count from the back. This one's got a lot of them, but on like a curly tail grub, for example, it doesn't have very many ribs. So when you line something like this up with your bait, figure out where I need to bring it out to be perfectly flush. Well, I know right now it's that last rib. That makes it really easy. So that doesn't, I don't need to hold it. I don't need to keep my mark on it. I just know when I pull my hook point out, I'm coming out that bottom rib. So that's a quick cheat way so that you don't internally mess up these soft plastics. They're really meant to be rigged once. The second that they start bouncing around on those collars or any type of locking pin that the hook shank might have on it, the more damage you're going to cause. And oftentimes the fish are going to do a lot of damage to them as well if they pull them off of the collar. So... Something to think about with those, but umbrella rigs are definitely very, very popular in today's fishing world for artificials. And that's because how else do you make a bait ball? You know, it's really giving you the best opportunity to present to a fish a pretty realistic um, thing that they're going to see in the water. So they are expensive, though. Use with caution if you don't have a bunch of money to throw on the bottom of the river. Uh, okay. So that moves us into kind of our true soft plastics of just rigging a soft plastic, whether it be an internally weighted swim bait, like these storm wild eye shad, these are the smallest models. Now in the tailwater, you're not going to want to throw that out there like that. Um, that's just too small, especially if, unless you've, again, like I said a little bit earlier, unless there's a really good uh, back eddy or something that's just disrupting a lot of that current flow where you're allowed to sink a 16th ounce or an eighth ounce deeper into the water column and work it without it getting flushed down um, and just not fishing very well in the strike zone for long enough. Um, but they make these all the way up to quarter ounce, half ounce. Uh, but you're really looking at starting eighth ounce at the smallest, but typically in tail waters, quarter ounce is a good start, especially if any water is being flushed. So... Before I get into those, we'll take a look. Looks like there's some questions back over in the chat bar. So what's the weight of the jig and the speed of the retrieve matter for curly tail action? Um, well, I think I kind of answered some of that just now with uh, looking to start off, you know, maybe an eighth ounce. If it's a smaller tail water, start with an eighth ounce work your way from the top of the water down again trying not to get hung up um, if you can catch fish before you've ever had your first snag it's a great day if if the first thing that you get some weight on the back end of uh, that rod tip is the bottom or a log or a snag that you know that, that starts off a frustrating day especially if you're not on fish right away um, so starting off a little bit smaller 
but in most cases, if any water is being generated and you're fishing anywhere near that flow, especially on the major uh, tailwaters, the big reservoirs, you're fishing in pretty deep water. I mean, relative to what that river channel is going to look like a few miles, maybe not even that far downstream as that prairie stream kind of goes back into its natural course, then you're only looking at water in some holes that's maybe four to eight feet deep. But right there at the, the base of the dam, depending on gradient of the stream, so how much water just inherently sits there when it comes out of the dam in that basin. Some stream grades are really shallow. So, I mean, that water, even when no water is being generated, is very, very deep. I mean, water that is much deeper than 10 feet. So anything over 10 feet for a bank angler is getting into deep water. Um, and you're in that in most tailwaters in the state, even some of the smaller ones. So that jig, your retrieve speed, you know, a lot of tailwater fishing is going to be temperate bass around the state. Uh, mainly white bass, but is, if you're in the Arkansas system, uh, the Grand system, you're going to find a lot of hybrids. In the Arkansas system, you're going to find those stripers as well. Same thing with Denison Dam down below Texoma. Um, and then some of your other tailwaters like Broken Bow or Ten Killer, those are all, you know, those support a year round trout fishery. So that water's much colder, not nearly as much flow. Then all of a sudden, a 16th ounce or an 8th ounce is plenty. Um, but when you're in that pumping, deep, sandy bottom water where it really dredges that out, it really pushes a lot of water, not a lot of current disruptions unless you have big boulder fields that are out there, big chunks of um, construction from when the dam was completed to really break up current, you're more than likely looking at starting off at a quarter ounce and then working your way up from there to get deeper and deeper and deeper down in the water column. Because if you're throwing like a chartreuse grub, uh, like a three inch or a three or five, three to five inch grub, let's see if we have, uh, here's some bigger ones. If you're in a major tailwater, starting off with something like this, which is going to be more in that four or five inch, depending on how you classify them. I mean, most baits, they're usually talking tip to tail. So something like this is going to be a, probably packaged as a five inch grub. So something like this, you're looking to pair it with a quarter ounce or a half ounce jig head. So a quarter ounce jig head is going to look like that. And then a half ounce jig head is going to be just a tad bit bigger, different styles and brands be painted or just be led. And with these, you know, if you, if you're throwing this and you're kind of mid river and you're working it back, just keep sizing up until you hit the bottom because something like this, when fish are active, especially temperate bass, walleye, saw guy, maybe even a blue cat, um, any type of the black bass species that may be in there, you should be getting bit on a chartreuse, you know, curly tail grub um, at this time of year, as and especially as we get into April and May. So if you're not getting bit, more than likely, you know, it has something to do with current speed and flow. So how much generation is going on? Are those fish sucking up in the water column for bait? More water moving? smaller bait, um, especially dead or dying bait is going to be up near the surface. When the current slows down, less water moving, all of the bait's going to start to fall back down to the bottom and those fish are going to suck down into the bottom third. So on the major, starting with a, a quarter ounce just to start and uh, working your way down. But even in super heavy flow, you know, a quarter ounce can get the job done. You may size up to a half ounce if you're in a real tight window of current. And it's just grabbing your bait and going. But for the most part, our big tailwaters, the major ones, they're 10 gates. So it's a big river channel. So even if they have all, you know, if they have four gates open or they have gates at half open and they're releasing, you know, you're going to be able to find seams that are close to the bank that aren't just ripping the bait through. Whereas if you were to go to like the lower Illinois below 10 killer in the summertime, late May, all the way through till October when those stripers push up in there to get that cooler water and they get out of the Arkansas and the Canadian and they move up, push up into the Illinois, sit in those deeper holes in the day. And then they wait for daily generation for that water level to pick up anywhere between two and 6,000 CFS. When you go and fish like 6,000 CFS, 4,000 
zero chance of getting down into the strike zone because that water is just rushing through there. And that's only because you just don't have a lot of space to work with. When you're on the big tail waters, um, you got a lot of river channel as far as width goes. So it allows the current to kind of slow down because the water is able to spread out. You get more of an even current through, and then you're looking to pick off all those seams. So you'll see, you know, that swirl on the top of the water, you'll kind of see like sheen of water moving at different speeds right next to each other. And those are your seam lines where you're expecting to get bit when you run your bait through that portion of the water. So you can typically achieve that with a quarter ounce, um, but you may size up to a half ounce. And if you can get away with an eighth ounce, even better. Um, just the less weight you have to throw is always less cumbersome. You're filtering a lot of water moving through current. The heavier the bait, the more worn out you're going to get, especially if you're not catching fish. Um, would I need a heavy rod for an umbrella rig or would a medium heavy be sufficient? Depends on the brand. I mean, a medium heavy action rod for certain brands is going to have a much stiffer rod deck all the way up through the tip. Some of them might have more of a sensitive tip in that last foot between, you know, that could be two or three eye guides to the top. In those cases, you know, Maybe you're using braided line, um, but when you're fishing those big lures, the big slabs, the big spoons, um, the big umbrella rigs, you, you're probably looking at a heavy action rod. Um, if you can throw a bait caster and throw, you know, 50, 65 pound braid, something like that, 30 pound braid at the lightest, that's just going to give you the best opportunity to not damage your equipment if you're not getting snagged up. It's not to say you can't do it with a medium or a medium action rod, but it's going to put a lot more stress on that rod tip. Um, you're not going to get as good a hook sets. You have this huge lure back in the water, a lot of weight. It does require a bit more of an exaggerated hard hook set. Whereas when you're fishing the curly tail grubs or the little swim baits, um, even the bladed jigs and spinner baits or little spoons, you know, you, you're getting bit on a smaller lure. You can load that rod tip up and get a pretty good hook set. But with these big monster, either, you know, weighted lures or just a big profile lure that also has weights, um, a, a heavy action rod with, you know, a bait caster and 30 up to like 65 pound braid is going to be perfectly tailored for that. It is not to say that you cannot go out there with, you know, 12 pound monofilament on a spinning rod. That's a medium or medium heavy action rod and not catch fish. It is just opening up the likelihood um, of losing the equipment, losing the fish, or at worst damaging your equipment. Um, especially throwing a bigger profile, uh, lure you hit a big striper on a medium action rod with 12 pound test you can land it but if you have a cheaper reel um, that doesn't have a lot of good drag to it and that fish is burning that drag it's going to wear the bearings out inside of that reel pretty quickly um, and it just doesn't more damage so really the only thing about tailoring your equipment and fishing is for the equipment's sake you, you do less damage and it's better on the fish. Obviously, the quicker you can land fish, the less stressed out they get, especially if you're planning on releasing them. Um, so utilizing equipment that's going to get those fish in the fastest without stressing them out. Uh, it's going to do wonders for the fish, going to do wonders for your equipment. So, but, um, you know, if you don't have a heavy action rod, you're going to use a medium heavy action rod. You're probably going to going to be okay. Um, but it does open it up for potential for equipment failure. So something to think about, but uh, what I like to do on a lot of stuff is I stopped, um, I stopped buying reels a long time ago. I mean, I'll buy one here or there, but I used to buy a reel for the rod. So I used to tailor every single rod and reel for a very particular thing that I was fishing for, um, whether it was, you know, a species or the place in which I was going. And I just ended up with a bunch of rods and reels that I very seldomly used. And a good thing that you can do uh, to save some money, but also, you know, be well equipped, buy reels. If you're going to buy anything, buy reels. Rods are pretty easy. You know, you can get into decent equipment, medium priced equipment, and you don't need, you know, as many of the reels. So if you have reels that have good drag on them, you can take that same reel and put it on a, uh, 
you know, a medium action rod, let's say, to go pond fishing or to go trout fishing. Um, and the same thing goes with like your bait casting equipment. If you can just take a bait caster that maybe you had on like a medium action rod because you're fishing top water on small lakes or ponds for largemouth, well, you can pop that reel off and go throw it on a heavy action rod. And if you're using braided line, you know, 30 pound braid is going to be plenty. Um, but 50 pound braid is usually a good happy medium for bait casting equipment that is used for top water. Um, you know, if you're flipping heavy cover or something like that, and just pop that reel off and go buy a cheap, heavy action casting rod. I mean, you can go to a Walmart and get a cheap, ugly stick or a cheap uh, shake or other types of Shakespeare brands um, or whatever they may have on sale. If they're trying to get rid of a product line or something like that, it's always good to check out the big box retailers, their end of season sales or before the new season, before the new stuff has come out and they're looking to offload a lot of inventory. You can go get yourself a nicer rod. You know, the, the common rods that are going to get you a lot of good action um, and last a long time are going to be like your Abu Garcia and your Luz. Those are going to be the two kind of major brands that you're going to see at a lot of different types of bait and tackle stores and they sell their combos and you can always buy a combo, but it's kind of like you can get their nicer versions of their rods because they come out with a, a upgraded version of the same brand line every year and go get those when they're you know half off and then just get yourself a couple nice reels that you can multi-purpose and that that can take a lot out of the oh do i need to pair this with this you have a few extra rods laying around in different weight classes but you have some really nice reels that can handle that drag because that's what you're paying for when you're paying a lot of money for a reel you're paying for the drag because uh, that's what puts the most stress on that reel easy to reel up line and it's easy to reel in a fish but if that fish is heavy enough that it can actually pull away from you, the rod is meant to take the tension away from the line. So in fly fishing, you oftentimes are using much lighter line class for big fish because you're using this long rod that is able to double or triple over and it takes that tension away so you don't get line breakage. If you have a heavy action rod and real light line, and a fish goes and runs and there's no drag, well, there's no give on the top of the rod. The line's not big enough to hold on to the fish itself. And then you're just going to pop the line. Um, so reels, what you're paying for is that drag. The rod, you're paying for casting and for fish fighting. That's basically you know what those two functions of those two um, pieces of equipment are. And then your line is just tailored somewhere in between. Um, so that would be my recommendation is, have a few rods laying around that don't have reels on them and then just get yourself a few nice reels that you get what you pay for and then you can use those and just swap them off and especially if you've like you know you've used one let's say for trout you have a good nice spinning reel well it's good to unspool whatever line you were using on it anyways and then maybe you can throw on some braided line or some heavier like fluorocarbon or monofilament to go into the big tail waters to fish with so all right, let's get into the swim baits, which is, again, the most popular category of fishing today when it comes to the tackle. Um, we showed the uh, little sassy shad style. So these are actual, well, no, these are headhunters. So again, different brand makes a similar sassy shad style, but chartreuse, Pearl white are kind of your two starting colors. And then you can also, you know, find those good in between colors, like the blue back with that chartreuse through it. Um, and these, they're, those are just real easy, compact baits or soft plastics to throw with a big jig head on them. So because they have that big, deep body on them, you're able to throw that half ounce jig head with the shorter shank on it because you have just enough to get that hook point out at the back of the tail. Um, and that's where those sassy shad really perform well is with upgrading um, the size of the jig head, whereas some of the more slender swim baits, just depending on what the brand is, what the type of plastic is, um, they don't pair well with those bigger, heavier uh, uh, jig heads of getting a smaller bait deeper into the water column, which is ultimately going to result in more bites more often than not. Um, so 
we end up with uh, these bigger style swim baits. So here's a box that's got some very big profile swim baits. In it. So we have our jointed shad over here. Um, these have been called different things by different brands over the years. It used to be the magic shad, but these are uh, Yamamoto jointed soft plastic baits. Uh, and then we got some bigger soft plastics and they have that nice big flat head on them. So you can pair these with very big jig heads. So starting off at like a three quarter ounce head going all the way up to an ounce, an ounce and a half and a few different style jig heads that you can look to use with these bigger profile baits. And this is where you're really looking for those big stripers, big hybrids, big blue cats. So if you're going to tailwaters because they have big fish and you're looking to target big fish, then throw those big baits um, if you're not using live bait. So here are a few different jig heads that we have. So here's just kind of a basic swim head. And this is a big, this is either a three quarter ounce or it's an ounce head. And pairing these, you have that nice square base of the head that is almost tailor made for a bait like this. So when you put this on the hook shank, work it on there. And these are great, uh, these big, heavy, especially if you're looking, you know, some specialty brands that only sell, like you only see them have like two packages. They don't have, they don't have a big brand product line these are real hardy. Like you can just feel on the plastic. Like these baits can take a beating when it comes to getting bit. They're going to last a while. So that sits nice and flush up against that jig head. And there's two different styles in here of these uh, baits. So this is going to be more of just our basic gizzard shad. So we have that dark back, that shiny, silver flakes mixed in body and then we have our thread fin shad which is going to be also that dark back but it's going to have that uh, chartreuse banding through it so those thread fin they have a bit of a flash through the middle of them and depending on what part of the state you're in gizzard shad are going to be everywhere thread fin are going to be most prevalent in the southern southeastern part of the state they're more of a warm water shad we get big thread fin die-offs in the lakes where they're in the northeast like an uchi that has thread fin in it typically see a pretty good thread fin die off but you only need a few fish to survive they're uh, prolific reproducers they'll rebound in a year so these are two if you're going to use these big big swim baits this is your gizzard shad skipjack here's your thread fin and that's always if you have a, a shad style bait that's got that um, chartreuse banding through the middle that's your thread fin um, and then if you have just the basic silverback gizzard chad or skipjack um, and these are big you know five six inch profiles and then we have more of our eight inch profile bait so here's that thread fin and here's a five six inch bait here's a seven eight inch bait and these are going to be paired at minimum with a half ounce jig head but these are meant to be thrown out there throw a long distance so you are going to need that stiff heavy action rod um, something with great castability so either a good monofilament or a good braided line um, a good happy medium for touch and feel uh, is going to be you know braided line with a a short one to two foot real thick heavy monofilament or uh, fluorocarbon leader double uni knot going to be the easiest connector knot to tie you can also tie like an fg knot a little bit more difficult double unis are super easy to learn how to do and once you get those and you can learn how to tie connector knots on really going to open up um, fishing for you as far as tailoring presentations for certain situations because braided line today for all intents and purposes has great castability great break strength it has the lowest line diameter so for break strength um, and the amount of total line the total yards that you can put on a reel once you get up to about 30 pounds you can put double 30 
you can put double of what you would spool 30 pound mono with, with 30 pound um, braided line. So if you were going to put 150 yards of 30 pound mono, if that fit on a reel, you could put 300 yards of um, 30 pound braid just because the line diameter is half. And that's really what rods and reels on our website right now. There's an article on our main page that's called choosing the right fishing line. It really breaks down the differences between monofilament, fluorocarbon and braided line, because the big difference is the diameter of the line in relation to the break strength. And that's going to be important when you go to see your rod or your reel and it's got those numbers written on it. Those were originally made when we were only using monofilament line. So a lot of people will go buy a spool of 10 pound braid for the spooling size of what it said for 10 pound test. They go and they put that braided line on their spinning reel or bait casting reel and realize that they've only spooled half or three quarters of their spool up. Um, and that just comes down to line diameter. But with these big baits, heavy action rods, heavy pound test, maybe a leader line, um, just depending on water clarity. If you're in that real turbid water braided line, any color is not really going to be a big detractant for the fish. But if you're over on the southeastern part of the state, far eastern part of the state, a little bit clearer water in some of those tail waters, and you want to use these big baits, um, electing to use a foot or two of like a fluorocarbon or monofilament um, leader line, just so you that fish is not seeing, you know, 10, 15 feet in front of that bait. It's keyed in on right behind the bait. So if you've got a couple of feet out in front of that bait where there's no visibility for a line attachment, that's plenty. You don't need any more than that. Um, but working these in on different types of jig heads, you have your straight swimming heads where you just throw these out and these cut right through the water. I'm just going to reel those right back in. Then you're going to have a uh, road runner style heads. So things that have underpin spinners on them like this. Again, we have that nice flat back. So these baits like this that have that squared off to put that jig head on, they run up perfectly against these. Then you get that extra flasher, which is always good. Um, and then we also have a bladed jig head. So get some of the action without the skirt of a bladed jig. And again, these are all meant to just swim. And the great thing about striped bass and temperate bass for that matter, so hybrid striped bass, as well as white bass. Once we're in the water temperatures here in the next few weeks, where we're well into the 50s, high 50s, you can't outrun a temperate bass. So most of my presentations when we're talking about different fish species is really the biggest problem that anglers face is they need to size down their lures or their bait and they need to slow down their presentation. They're just going way too fast. Striped bass, hybrid bass in these tailwaters or really anywhere for that matter, but especially in tailwaters where they are consolidated. They got nowhere to go. You're not out on the boat running electronics, following schools around all day, trying to get them to take. This is these fish are living right there. They're faced upstream and they're waiting for food to come by. And they know that they got to compete with everything else in there. And the way that they are built, they are, I mean, stripers are made for rivers. They're a, um, they're not native to Oklahoma. They are a saltwater fish. So they're an andromedous species on the East coast, like steelhead are on the West coast. Um, so they live their adult lives out in the salt water and they run annually up the tributaries, these major rivers on the East coast or in steelhead's case, all along the West coast and British Columbia up into Alaska. And they swim up and they spawn. And unlike salmon, that only spawn once and die. These are andromedous fish that go up into the freshwater and then back out into the salt water. So stripers, I mean, they live, you know, their DNA is meant for living out in saltwater current, traveling current runs, and then going up rivers. So these things are essentially torpedoes, um, even in the hardest rushing water. So you can't out swim them. So with these, you cast these out on these big, heavy jig heads that are going to sink fast. And if you're not going fast enough, you're going to find trouble on the bottom. Though you burn them. You want to reel as fast as you can reel. Uh, but hang on. Um, and I, I, I don't mean that lightly. Literally hang on. Because if you're ripping something that big with that big, heavy action rod and you're not paying attention, you're kind of looking around, it will take the rod from you, um, especially a fish over 10 pounds. 
because you're retrieving so fast. That fish is swimming so fast. It drills it and turns in another direction. And that rod is out in the middle of the river before you know it. So if you are targeting trophy class fish, uh, especially striped bass where you are retrieving for them, uh, you're more than likely not going to get a blue cat running that fast. You slow your retrieve speed down a little bit with like a big spoon or slab um, or even one of those big swim baits that's kind of fluttering through the water. You might get a blue cat to come whack that. Um, but the same goes for if you're fishing with bait off the bottom in these tailwaters. Do not leave your rod unattended. It will be gone. So that is something definitely to think about. If you're using expensive equipment and you just hooked into the, maybe for you, for somebody like, man, I was a fish of a lifetime. And you know, I never got to see it. And I took my rod with me too. So hold on when you're ripping those through for striped bass. Um, other than ballooning baits for catfish, what would you really need 200 plus yards of line in Oklahoma? It's the drag. So you get into a big fish and it wants to go down river and you have any current, you can't go. I mean, you can't, when you're bank fishing, you can't go with it. So having drag, allowing a fish to run across the river, which may be in some cases 200 yards across or go down river. It might go down river 150 yards. So having, being able to utilize braided line and tail waters where you can essentially take any size reel you don't need to use the huge, massive reels that were made to be mainlined with big, thick monofilament line where you can get two, 300 yards of 30, 40, 50 pound monofilament. You don't need that. You can still use these real nice bass style um, casting or spinning equipment with real good drags on them. And it downsized the profile, takes the stress off the angler. You're making lots of casts all day long. The bigger equipment that you're using is going to take a lot out of you. So when you can utilize these smaller, you know, carbon rods that are made for bass fishing, um, that are heavy action, pair them with smaller reels, also made for bass fishing. Uh, but you can put a much, uh, basically double your school with braided line. It's going to come in handy when you hook a big fish. Uh, they're going to, you're going to allow them to take the braid. Otherwise you're using a big surf rod hook into a fish. Then yeah, drag probably isn't as important because if you're using that much equipment, you should be able to fork that fish in. Um, but that takes a little bit of the fun away from fishing for big fish, which is using, you know, a little bit smaller equipment uh, to get that fight and get that action, but you're still well within range to be able to land them as well as not overstress the fish because even a big fish on a surf rod um, you hook into a 50 60 pound catfish and you have a big pen you know saltwater reel with a huge meat hunter um, that is not going to break the fish isn't going to break the rod and they're probably not going to spool you they're probably not going to snap the line um, they're still going to be able to you know run with it a little bit so that's kind of the main reason for using a lot, you know, having 300 yards of 50 pound braid is going to come in really handy with good drag in a tailwater when you're bank fishing. Cause now you've got full control of that fish and it's just easier to cast. I mean, those big surf rods, big catfish rods, they're cumbersome when you're throwing 30, 50 pound mono out into the water. Uh, if you're not catching fish now, it's great. If you're bottom fishing, if you're just going to throw bait off the bottom and you're only making maybe a dozen casts a day, that's fine. Like, you know, that's the perfect rod and reel setup for that. But if you're going to be fishing for walleye and sogeye and temperate bass below these tailwaters, which you're casting lures and making lots and lots of casts, having a shorter seven foot rod, maybe up to like a seven and a half foot rod, but even a six foot six rod that's in a medium heavy to heavy action class with a, you know, a medium sized casting reel or spinning reel it's just going to go a long ways in improving your overall experience as well as having enough to hold on to the fish um, and you're also you know you're going to be able to make more cash you're not going to feel like you're just filtering water all day so uh so good soft plastic baits as trailers or with jig heads or to put with alabama rigs are just going to be your basic bumper tail or fluke style baits. So lots of different sizes, 
and shapes of essentially the same thing. Got some chartreuse, mostly white, chartreuse and white, and then a natural green pumpkin style for if there is some black bass species that you can pair that either with just a jig head or put it on a bladed jig. But great thing about tailwaters is you have current, so you're getting great action. Flukes are favored in the current as opposed to bumper tail, especially if you're using it as a trailer because you're getting all the tail whip. You're getting all that action just from the current. You don't have to do anything. When you're in still water, like a lake or a pond, and you're trying to create some water displacement, fluke doesn't really do that for you because you're moving it through still water. It's not, you know, it gets a little bit of action, but it's not flipping through the water. Whereas that paddle tail and that still water is thumping. It's displacing water. It's stimulating lateral lines of all these predator fish, keying them in on where to go. Not as important when you're in the moving current. So flukes can come into play. And flukes are very versatile. Um, you can throw this as a top water. So if you were to take a, I don't think I have any, I don't have any bass gear here, but if you had just a basic um, three aught to five aught offset or extra wide gap hook, and you go right in through the nose, I mean, we can probably rig one up just with a bait hook just to show it. This is not the type of hook you want to use, but just for demonstration's sake of how you would rig a weightless, weedless fluke. So depending on the brand and the model, some of them are going to have this open belly underneath them, and they are made for those offset hooks that have the weight on the shank of the hook. So you'll have, sometimes they'll have a jig head uh, or a, a bullet weight as part of the eye component and a collar, and then it'll turn, and then on the turn of the hook, it will have weight affixed to it, tungsten, lead, um, and then that's where it hides it in here. And the rigging style for that is a little bit different. Most of the time, if it isn't one that has the bullet weight on the top, it just has an eye hole, and then you have the uh, weight on the turn of the shank, those ones you actually want to go up under the belly side and push the eye hole through because they have weight. And so it sticks out on the shank. So if you pull it through the hook nose, like you would with one that doesn't have weight. So if this was one of those, you would just want to pop that hook, that eye hole in and then push it out through the nose. Cause you pull all that weight through, you're going to create air pockets in here, which is ultimately going to lead to the bait getting destroyed quicker. So if this was an offset bass hook, three aught to five aught, it's not, it's just a little medium size, probably, I think it's an eagle claw, just medium-sized bait holding hook. But if you were to rig this weedless and weightless with an offset hook, we would go in through the nose and you come down about a, a quarter of an inch, maybe not even that far, and you pop that hook point out on the belly side of the bait. And then you work that bait up. And if it was an offset hook where it comes in and turns, we have a nice little collar to position it on. We don't have that here, but it will turn the bait over. It'll turn it right side up. So you can bring the hook point through the belly of the bait and then out the back. And then that hook point is up there on the back. And to make it weedless, you would simply just pull the bait forward a little bit and let it fall back and it sticks that in there. So when the fish comes and gets it, it knocks the hook point clear so you can set the hook. But you would throw that out there as a top water because the current's moving and it's gonna slowly sink just subsurface. And you can just work it. I mean, you can like flick it back and forth, like a walk the dog lure or a jerk bait. You can straight retrieve it. But that with the fluke, it's just going to look like a dying shad up on top. It is a dynamite setup when you're fishing for smallmouth bass on clear water streams in eastern Oklahoma or northwestern Arkansas, southwestern Missouri. You can tag some of the biggest smallmouth on a river fishing like that. But it's very effective sometimes for surfacing temperate bass. If you don't have hard baits or if you, if you can't work the hard bait, especially like a walk the dog, if you're struggling to time, get the timing right with the moving water to get it to walk properly. Well, this is the beginner version. And sometimes it's more deadly than the hard bait top water because the water is doing most of the work for you. And that little tail is just going to flick through. 
So you can just slow retrieve it, cast it straight perpendicular or just a tad upstream. And it's just going to kind of like fly fishing where you're throwing across current, letting a big bow out in your line with a streamer or a jig fly. And the current's doing all the work for you. You're just giving subtle twitches of the line to make it kind of twitch and move. And you're going to get that in those big tailwaters and just have that flip through. So flukes, definitely very underrated, underutilized, great tailwater bait, especially for temperate bass. But occasionally blue cats. If blue cats are really up on like up near the dam or there's just a ton of dying bait fish, flukes are really good in this in these colder weather months if fish are looking to come up, especially if water's being generated. So flukes are really good early season um, bait selections to use for soft plastics. So that brings us through um, the kind of lure portion of, of this uh, course. If anybody's got any questions, throw them in there. Uh, I'll talk a little bit now about kind of live bait fishing or dead bait fishing with natural bait, uh, fishing off the bottom in a tailwater. So as was discussed at the beginning of this presentation, I don't know if it was on stream two here or the first stream that we had going before we were interrupted. Um, but when you're fishing these big tailwaters, like I said, you're trying to utilize baits that you're not getting on the bottom. You know, you got all this current, any given tailwater stuff can flush through the dam. There's just lots of debris, lots of things to get hung up on. So when you're fishing off the bottom, obviously that's going to come into play if you're fishing for catfish uh, or if you're fishing a live minnow night crawler maybe you're looking to catch some sawgye walleye even white bass or tempered bass that are going to sit down on the bottom you could use a live bait with a leader line utilizing some type of no roll weight i would stay away from like the egg weight presentations when you're out in that moving water because they're going to roll you're looking for no roll weights when you're in current um, or some type of snag free weight but typically the snag free weights are meant to be trolled they're drug behind the boat and they sit on the bottom and those look like this come in different sizes, handmade ones. So these are like rock bouncers. These are typical, these are real common in walleye fishing up in the Northern States. And essentially this stops and you'll have a leader line out behind it. And you're either running some type of crawler harness, live minnow. Um, you may even be using like, a shallow diving crankbait behind it so you get it down on the bottom of the water column but it doesn't really have a lot of dive and so you're allowed to fish like a jerk bait or something that doesn't really want to dig down a couple feet off the bottom behind a leader line and you drag these but they're not going to work very well when you're out in that current again it's going to push them around um, so and here's some real big ones something like this Something like this that's really bendable, you know, homemade things, big weights. These might work out when you're casting 45 degrees downstream and allowing that bait to find a good spot and get tight line to it where you can set your rod up to fish with. Something like this that's not going to get snagged because it's bendable, if it's heavy enough, might hold the bottom well for you. If you're really looking for um, no roll weights. Something like this where when this finds the bottom, it can sit down flush. The water flows over the top of it and it holds you right on the bottom. Whereas egg weights or even casting weights, things like this, casting weight, maybe if it's heavy enough, it can hold um, something like this is just going to get ripped around in the current and it's going to move you around, which sometimes can be a good thing. I mean, for your live bait, the problem is, is it's eventually going to find its way underneath a rock or underneath the hang up. And that's the most common problem with bank anglers and bottom fishing is you're almost never hung up from your hook. Your hook isn't snagged on anything, especially if you're using, you know, you throw a, a worm out, it just sinks down to the bottom. If there's any current, it's going to sit just above the bottom and pulse in the current. And if you're using a live minnow, well, the live minnow is going to be swimming around down there. So it's not going to, your hook's not going to be stuck in anything. What happens is you reel up that slack on still water. You're nice and tight. And then your line sinks, especially, you know, when you're fishing off the bottom, you really want to be using like braided line with the leader line, which can be a dangerous proposition if there's a ton of rock, because if your connection is at your swivel, let's say, let's say you, your main line is braid, it goes down, you put your weight on your main line, and then you put your swivel on to stop the 
uh, weight, and then you have your leader line off of it, you know, your main line out there, it, this doesn't really happen in rivers because you're allowing, you're throwing your bait out 45 degrees downstream when you make the cast. Always cast downstream. If you cast straight across, that current is going to push, 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 and your weight is, even a no-roll weight, it's going to find a snag before it ever has time to settle. What you're looking to do is cast 45 degrees downstream, and hopefully you have enough weight on that when it drops and you're using a big rod. So the big thing about um, uh, bottom fishing in current, you want a taller rod. You want a longer rod. I mean, seven feet, depending on how high up above the water and how far you're casting out might be good enough, but you're really looking for rods that are nine, 10, 11, 12 feet long. And that's because that high points your main line, which means the distance traveled on that line in relation to where your bait was at stays out of the water. You want as little line between where the line touches the water and where your actual bait is at. That will eliminate any of that current flow pushing you around and getting you up and underneath snags. So casting 45 degrees downstream, allowing that weight to sink, and hopefully you're getting real good at that where your cast sinks. There's almost no movement before you set that rod in the rod holder. Um, but no roll weights when you're in the tailwaters um, are going to give you a lot less hangups. And then your bait selections from there, hook sizes is really just dependent on what you're looking to catch, how you're looking to fish. I mean, you can go with up to, for catfish, like a seven aught circle hook. It's kind of a good, good medium. You start getting into the eight and up, 10, 12 aught hooks. They're just too big. Um, a seven aught hook is going to catch small catfish, but it's also going to be perfect for those big, big cats that get it. Nice thick wire hook, no chance of straightening it out. Um, so if you're looking to target big catfish, big catfish are kind of an, an equipment investment. You need to have a reel with good drag on it. You need to have a good sturdy rod. You need to be using heavy equipment. So that means buying, you know, good brand name hooks that have real thick wire that aren't going to bend out. Because when you hook into that 40 plus pound catfish out in that moving water, you know, you, it will pay for itself on that first fish. Um, otherwise, if you're not using heavy enough, you hit in that lunker, you're going to have lots of problems and that heavier equipment and nicer reels and line and rod also going to do a lot better throwing significant weight. If you can hold the bottom with one ounce, that's fantastic. But more than likely, you're going to be looking at starting off with at least a two ounce all the way up to four or five ounces. And that's just a lot of tension, even on a bass rod. So a heavy action bass rod, that's a, that is just too much weight for that rod to eventually you might break the rod on a cast. So you really are looking for a big Shakespeare rod, a big cat max rod, a big meat hunter rod where the, the rod deck itself is pretty thick all the way to the tip that rod tip nice big iron guides on there that aren't going to get bent or flimsy things like that and that's going to go a long ways to catching bigger fish um, as well as just taking care of your equipment utilizing all that current and weight and everything else so for hooks you know for catfish circle hooks are great um, for all the other species any type of bait holding hook various sizes this is kind of a, a medium size hook. You can go even smaller than that, just depending on where you're fishing, what you think you might get into. And then your bait choice, night crawlers are great, especially if you're getting into a lot of channel cats, sog eye, walleye. Live minnows are great. If you got crappie down towards the bottom, white bass, temperate bass. If you're throwing a throw net around, um, getting into um, your shad, skipjack, cutting them in half, throwing them out there. That's going to be your, your key bait for any of the catfish species. And it may catch some bigger temperate bass. Use the tail end of the bait. So if you're catching shad, cut that shad in half, center hook it, let that tail get down in that current on the bottom. Give yourself one to two feet, probably more towards two feet. Give yourself some, a bigger leader line behind where that swivel is. So that bait's able to kick up into that current. And then your leader line always should be monofilament. Um, monofilament is a buoyant floating line 
and it does very well as a leader line for bottom fishing. Braided line also floats, but it's a smaller diameter and it does terribly in rocks. Um, where braid outpaces fluorocarbon and monofilament in hardwoods and grass and cover, uh, it does not outperform like a monofilament for abrasion resistance in rocks. Rocks will shred braid to pieces, even 65 pound braid. So when you're fishing off the bottom, even if braid's your main line, it's probably okay. Um, you could tie on like a big, you could tie on a leader line, you double uni before you get to where your swivel is at. That way, the last couple of feet of your line down to the bottom are more abrasion resistance and then tie on your swivel and then tie on your monofilament uh, leader line. It's just adding an extra knot that can fail when you cast or from abrasion. So <clears throat> that really comes down to just the, the comfortability level of the person themselves who's fishing and what you're comfortable with. If you're really good at not tying and you're not worried about that, use braid, give yourself a two foot leader line of the same monofilament that you plan to use for your leader line from your swivel. That way that last two feet on the bottom that may have a lay down or big rocky outcropping, big boulders, concrete slabs, rebar, anything like that, that you might get into in a tailwater. Um, you've taken that out of play and then you're, uh, and both of those lines uh, braided to monofilament, they're both buoyant lines. So they should tight line really good. Uh, don't use fluorocarbon uh, for either your main line or your leader line. It's going to sink and it is not as abrasion resistant as a uh, monofilament. So if it gets any type of nick in it, very susceptible to a line pop, even on the heavier poundage of the fluorocarbon. Uh, have you tried a planer board on a river? No, I haven't personally. I mean, I see people do it. Um, for me, I, I do just fine in the different situations that I put myself in. Um, if I'm going to go to a tailwater and I've, you know, maybe I'll have a catfish rod in the truck, fish during the day, late afternoon, go after the temperate bass species. And then as you get into the overnight hours, the dark hours, break out the, the catfish rod. Or if I'm in an area that has sawgye or walleye, you might have two rods going, catfish rod out there deeper in the middle off the bottom. And then, um, nearby using more of a bass style rod to fish off the bottom for sawgye or walleye but i haven't used a planer board um in a tailwater what's the best place in eastern oklahoma for a beginner to target striped bass so we don't really have a lot of striped bass in in eastern oklahoma unless you're considering you know just depends on what your definition of Eastern Oklahoma is. Tulsa, you got stripers. You're going to have stripers in the Arkansas River below Keystone. That can be very productive in April and May for stripers. So that's a good place for a beginner to go. It's a huge tailwater. It's got nice public access, lots of places to fish. Um, aside from that, there is stripers down below Eufaula. Um, so on the Canadian you also have nice public access down onto a sandy beach. Um, but the striped bass population down there can be a lot more hit or miss than it can be at Keystone or Caw um, on the Arkansas, where they really pile up underneath those um, bodies of water that are there. So, I mean, in eastern Oklahoma, I'd say for a beginner, Keystone's probably the starting place. The Illinois River is tough from the bank to fish for stripers when they're running water. Um, there's a lot of them in there and, but you really kind of need to be out on a boat to move around and find those fish. They're going to move up and down river throughout the course of the day with the generation schedule. Um, and then same thing at Keystone, but it's a bigger ceiling basin. So you're going to have fish that are up by the dam year round. It's just, they need that water to turn on for the bank anglers to really get after them with lures or bait. Um, yeah, if you're in Claremore, definitely below Keystone be a good place to start here in about a month from now, maybe month to six weeks. We just we don't have really any rain in the forecast. And um, most of our prairie streams that come through the Canadian for Eufaula um, and then the Washita for Texoma and uh, the Arkansas and the Cimarron, those are, you know, west of I-35 when they start. So you're looking at 
a lot of drought stricken rivers. So in order to get, you know, you get over into green country, you're on the Illinois system, the Grand River system, those consistently, even in drought years, pick up spring flooding. So you always get generation through that. Now, if you're in Claremore, if you go east, not striped bass, but there is pretty good hybrid striped bass fishing um, over Fort Gibson. So fishing below the dam at Fort Gibson, fishing the low water or the dam at Hudson, or going up to Disney and fishing below the dam for Grand. Those are all three pretty good white bass and hybrid striped bass. And there's some good ones in there. Um, but if you're looking to maybe get into a 15 plus pound fish that's a striped bass, Keystone's going to be your your starting point but we really need some water we just there's nothing in the forecast that's going to move the needle um, for our prairie streams right now so white bass fishing has been very inconsistent tailwater fishing has been slow because there's no water generation there's not we're we're in winter drawdown right now so we're waiting for spring rains to come in just to fill up these reservoirs to full pool to then begin a regular generation schedule of releasing water. And that's what it takes for really any of these species to get going, but especially the temperate bass. Um, you're not going to have a lot of success for walleye, sogeye, striped bass, white bass, hybrid striped bass, if there's no water running. Um, catfish are a different story. You can get into the different species of catfish at different times of the year with no flow. That's mainly because you're fishing off the bottom with bait. They're going to eat. They're willing to take dead bait. So shad cut in half, night crawlers. They're willing to take that. Whereas striped bass um, and, you know, your perch species like your walleye and your sogeye, they prefer some current to make them feed. So it's tough until we get that water. Um, and right now it's like best case scenario is a month from now because the 10 day forecast, the 14 day forecast, we need water west I-35 and we haven't got that significantly yet. We got a good bout of rain last week, two weeks ago, um, but it really didn't start until I-35. So water that lakes and tailwaters that typically are getting water are getting water, but the big places, the big tailwaters, um, that can support a lot of angling pressure, the Eufaulas, the, um, and especially the Arkansas, Caw and Keystone, we just, we need the water. So right now we had great mild winter, super mild winter. Like it gets you into March, early March, late February, it's 75 degrees. You have some good patterns, good periods of active feeding fish in certain areas, white bass that have moved up into these river systems that are looking for staging areas and that went on for like two weeks and it just has stopped so unless you're in southeastern oklahoma right now where you've got a bunch of water um the last couple of weeks enough for the white bass run enough for the walleye run uh, and then for your tail waters as those are filling up they're going to start releasing water below them and you're going to start getting a lot of good catfish activity here in about a month. You're going to start getting really good crappie activity, good temperate bass. So right now, the only game in the state that's going on is the southeastern part of the state. And that's water temperatures. Water temperatures are good across the state. They're much higher than they typically are at this time of year. So really, three quarters of the state for our best fishing of the year, we're just waiting on rain. Um, the second that we get that first two, three day deluge of two, three, four, five inches in a 72 hour window, it's going to kick off so many species at the same time because the water temperatures are there. But if you're looking to get after fish right now and you don't live in the area, but you want to make a trip looking at areas in the southeastern part of the state, there's plenty of water down there. The Mountain Fork, um, the Kayamichi, those are going to be two really good river systems to look at if you're looking at getting into white bass. And then the tailwaters of those. So below Hugo, below Sardis, um, those are going to be areas that have some water that they can generate and the water temperatures are there. So you're going to see a lot more actively feeding fish in those small tailwater basins. But for the rest of us, you know, we're still probably a month away from seeing our first real good fishing on any body of water um, that's not in the southeast and especially in the tailwaters until they can start doing regular generation. Um, so with that, um, 
We're at our two hour mark on our second stream. So we've got a bonus 30 minute interruption uh, for the beginning of the first stream. So if anybody's got any questions, go ahead and throw them in there right now. Uh, otherwise we appreciate y'all being here and watching. Uh, can't do this without you. We are not a state appropriated agency. We don't receive any state tax dollars. So we are completely funded through fishing and hunting license sales, as well as the excess uh, excise taxes that come off of um, hunting and fishing equipment, ammo, guns, marine fuel. That goes into a big federal pot for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And the people who work for state agencies across the country for Fish and Wildlife were able to apply for grants. And 25% of what we pay is then matched 75% from those federal excise taxes. So it is a true North American model of conservation here in Oklahoma. It is a user pay, user benefit. More people participating, more people showing interest in the sport, buying fishing tackle, buying hunting equipment, um, the size of our state, as well as our population size, and then applying that to the percentage of that who actively own on a given year a hunting or fishing license is what generates the amount of money that we can get from these federal grants. And that's really what funds everything we do. So these videos, uh, any of our angler guides, all of the work that our field biologists do, management, stocking, food plots, road building, dock building, fishing jetty, maintenance, that's all funded through you guys in one way or another, either directly through the fishing and hunting license sales or from buying equipment to um, participate in the sport, all that money comes back in. So we can't thank you enough. We're here to help. If you ever have questions, please call, email, text, reach out. I'll get you the answer or I'll get you to the person who can give you a better answer. Uh, and then if there's ever anything that you want to see uh, out of our content, whether it be our guides, our articles, our videos, let us know. We're here to serve you. So if there's subject matter, method to take, species, water body, um, we will do our best to facilitate that request either directly through myself or through another member of our agency who has a little bit more knowledge in that subject matter. So appreciate y'all being here. Um, we're right there. I mean, we got the weather, got the water temperatures. We really just need the rain. So be on the lookout for that. This first chance that you get when we get that two, three inch rain that's coming at some point in the next month. That'll be the time to hit up those tailwaters and fishing will really just go from really nothing to like a light switch. We're not going to have much of a transition this year. It's going to be rain and the game is on. So stay safe out there. Tight lines. Appreciate you being here and we will see you next time.